I suppose, I suppose I should start by, by saying what a pleasure it is to be here. But I have to say it's with some unease that I'm here. Uh, particularly, you know, those who study the work that we do as a regulator. Uh, I think I should sort of know what I'm doing, but I think you know, many of you probably know more about my job than I know about it myself. Uh, and actually, I mean, there is just a, a, a note of perhaps caution there in, in what we're talking about, because some of you do analyze what we do as a regulator, and you say, you know, oh, this follows this, and there's this pattern there, which sometimes is true, but very often, you know, we just, I hate to say we make it up as we go along, <laughs> but we, we just do what's right at the time. And David has a, a, an uncanny ability to make me particularly uneasy because he always says, well, you know, you said that in that piece of guidance two years ago and now you're saying that today. And how does that tie up with, you know, this judgment on Satamedia or whatever? And I think, well, I ought to be able to answer him, but really I haven't got the foggiest idea and I'm not sure that they do. And, and not everything necessarily does tie up. And I wonder if, you know, there certainly is for us as a regulator. I wonder if even with a little bit of the, with the courts and even the CJEU, whether, you know, you can analyse it too far and sometimes they just decide what's right sort of on the day in, 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 in the circumstances. I have to say, David, you made me even more uneasy by inviting me very kindly to the post-conference dinner at, at uh, Trinity Hall. Uh, a college which, I'm sure much to its regret, declined to have me as one of its students some 43 <laughs> years ago when I applied to them. So, <laughs> But you didn't know that. Unless it's on Google, of course, and you could have uh, uh, searched for it. Might it might be now. <laughs> <laughs> it, pro it probably will be, 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 be knowing you. Now, what I want to do, and, and I haven't got long, is just say a little bit about how we see the judgment as the regulator, uh, Put it in a wider context and then talk about, you know, not just about the, 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 the Google judgment, but about the, the, you know, the forthcoming regulation uh, and the impact that that will have on the shape of EU regulation of, of the Internet. So, I mean, the judgment, we, we've talked about this. You know, the, the crucial thing really for us was that the court decided that Google was a data controller uh, the way in which it, 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 it processes personal data. And the clear message that we read from that is, look, you, know, you sort of don't escape EU law by some argument that you know, we're neither a controller nor a processor, or we've come along since the legislation was developed, and so we're sort of not caught by it. Uh, you know, eventually, the law will catch up with you. So if you're doing anything as a, an organization, a business on the internet, that involves you know, manipulating information about individuals that has some sort of impact on them, you get caught. And it's not that, you know, it's not personal data or we're not a controller, uh, uh, you'll get caught. And of course, you get caught territorially on applicability, but I'll leave that. That's more for, for, for discussion in the next session. And then, of course, Chris Pounder, I think, was right. Once you get to the, you know, you're a controller, EU law applies, then it's just binary. Once you're a controller, the, the uh, 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 whole obligations of the directive then fall on you to comply with. Yes, that leaves us with a bit of a mess. There's a quandary, things like uh, sensitive personal data. Forgive me, David, don't ask me to answer that. There's a problem there. Uh, you know, uh, but it will be solved somehow at some point, and it's the right direction uh, 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 that we're, we're heading in. And, of course, you know, implementation of the judgment, yes, there are uh, 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 critics of it, but these, you know, there are 200,000 people now who have complained to, 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 to Google. You know, nearly half of those have had the, the URLs uh, removed, there, and very few have ended up as complainants to data protection authorities. So there are, I hesitate to say it, but a lot of satisfied people or a lot of people who have had real concerns and whose uh, privacy is better protected now. So it is having uh, 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 e e exactly the, the, the right effect. But let's just look at it in, in context. Again, others... Uh, particularly all of this morning have talked about that you know, this is just part of the way uh, the CJU case law I I is going. So I won't develop that further. I think what's very important for us is the emphasis that's being placed by the CJU on the Charter and particularly on Article 8, uh, the right to data protection and seeing that coming through. And we, I think, you know, all of us in this sort of data protection community owe a huge vote of thanks to a former chair of the Article 
29 working party, Professor Rod Attar. I have to say, not for the way he chaired the meetings, but for <laughs> the work he did in actually uh, working politically to get this data protection right inserted in the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights which was being developed. And I don't think any of us other than him realized how important it would be. And it really is making a, 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 a big difference now. And I think we're seeing, you know, not necessarily the Charter itself, but uh, the direction of travel flowing through into to, to the uh, UK courts. There was a case, just a High Court case, a few weeks ago in Northern Ireland concerning Facebook where uh, an individual who uh, uh, brought a case to court against Facebook and against someone who was running a, a, a Facebook page on keeping our kids safe from predators. And this was about, uh, well, outing paedophiles, paedophiles who, who served their, their, their sentences and who were being rehabilitated into the community. Uh, and the court there... Uh, not under data protection, although data protection issues were raised, find not just uh, uh, the person running this, 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 this page, but Facebook themselves, 15,000 pounds, I think it was, on the basis that you know, they had a responsibility for the content that other people were putting on, on, onto Facebook. And they, we've just got this direction of travel where it's not, you know, Facebook isn't a neutral place where you post information uh, and it's only sort of between the, 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 you know, the individuals uh, who are posting it and, uh, 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 and people who see it. And I'm sure Hugh will tell us more about you know, today's Court of Appeal judgment, which is all part of the, 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 the same trend. Uh, we talked about the, the courts being emboldened. Uh, I think you know, we as regulators are emboldened as well because it's all going, we've got a fair wind behind us. It's all going in, in, in the right direction of travel. And I remember you know, we, it, it, the ICO took a case, uh, this must be getting on for 10 years ago, about police retention of, of, of data in the UK. And essentially, you know, the police retain criminal conviction information forever. And we thought that was excessive in, in data protection terms. And although we won our case at the first stage tribunal, uh, the Court of Appeal came down heavily against us. Uh, I think the Court of Appeal... Well, they might come to the same conclusion now, but their reasoning uh, and approach will be much more favourable to our position uh, now than it would have been. We've got, a, yeah, as I say, a fair wind behind us. I think also, and this isn't the, the, the Google case, you know, the Snowden revelations do have a real impact on uh, internet regulation in, in, in the future. Uh, the lack of trust... The, the impact on, on, on encryption and can we you know, encrypt our messages and, uh, and trust encryption. The impact that this has on the draft European regulation, where we see some of you will know Article 43A introduced by the Parliament, which attempts, I think, to do the impossible, to reconcile what's a conflict of laws where... I mean, everybody points to the US, but it's not just the US, but where uh, businesses in Europe are required by US law to release information on some significant penalty from the US, but releasing that information would actually be a breach of the European uh, legal framework. Uh, I have to say, we as regulators can't really resolve that. Only governments uh, 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 and international treaties can. But it's all playing into the future of regulation. Uh, and with the, the, the proposed regulation, the future regulation, I think what we are seeing is that sort of case law under the existing directive is moving us actually closer to what's proposed in the regulation. So maybe when we get the regulation, you know, eventually, maybe a year's time from now, it won't be quite the leap uh, that we were expecting because under case law, we'll be a long way, way in that direction or, or, or already. Just a, a couple of points about the uh, regulation. I won't uh, uh, go into to, to detail about all of these, but the material scope that... Processing of personal data is huge. You know, everything is caught. At one time, we were talking, our IP addresses caught by this? Clearly, they are now. As technology moves on and we move to IPv6, you know, they will be even more clearly uh, our, our personal information. So again, you know, technology 
is taking us more towards IP addresses being personal data, the way the law is, is taking us more to it. It's all, all, all converging. Territorial scope we'll, we'll cover. People place a lot of emphasis on consent. And as a regulator, I get very concerned about those who see consent as the answer to every problem. Uh, and if we just give individuals consent to everything, you know, they will be protected and that will be fine. And in practice, of course, that doesn't work. Uh, people, you know, they don't make informed choices, they just plow ahead. We need to think more, more intelligently than just seeing our, our consent a, 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 as the answer. We have the right to be forgotten in the regulation, as it was called, although whether that will be the title at the end, because it was just a, as an accurate title in the regulation uh, 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 as it is about the, the, the Costagia uh, uh, decision. But what we do have uh, there, and what I think is very important, is this right to object. Where put very simply, under the, the way the law is currently uh, uh, structured, I can object to the, your processing of my data, whether it's on the internet or not. But I have to make the compelling case to you as to why that should happen. Uh, the onus, if it goes through, will be the other way around. Uh, and I make my case, I just say I object. And you have to make the compelling case as to why you should continue to process. And I think, although there's been very little attention, if that comes through and that right exists, it really will shift the balance of power and put some very important rights in, in, in the hands of individuals. Just to talk about the exemptions and derogations, you know, David would, would think I was amiss if I didn't talk about the exemptions for uh, freedom of expression. What I would just say, they, these are hugely uh, important. And the whole basis of the regulation is about harmonization across Europe, the same rules. Yet, when we come to the exemptions from freedom of expression, these are left up to member states. I mean, I happen to think that's right, because I think harmonization is a step too far. More consistency, yes, maybe not harmonization. So we still will see, I think, you know, potentially significant differences uh, are, are, are in how this is applied. Uh, I know I've only got a, a minute or so left, so just a word about our, 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 our role as supervisory authorities. You know, life, I don't make any pleas, but life is getting more and more difficult for us. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Google decision, these decisions on what should be taken down, what links should be moved, are very difficult decisions. I mean, there are extremes and anybody can make those, but the ones around criminal convictions and you know, should it just be spent convictions come, round, come down? Uh, and what if you're, you know, they're convictions to do with uh, commercial businesses, fraudulent trading, and you're still trading, even though it's a spent conviction, should that go and so on? Very difficult uh, decisions. I have to say that I think the, the Rhinus decision uh, makes life even more difficult for us uh, because it does take us into processing by individuals. Uh, and you know, yes, you have your CCTV camera on your house. It's overlooking a public area. And I think must be by extension. If it's overlooking your neighbor's garden, then that's probably not, you know, within the domestic exemption. So how do we, how do we deal with warring neighbours over, you know, someone's camera <laughs> snooping on another? Uh, it's a very, and, and the, it's not just sort of difficult to, to, to deal with the, the, the individuals who are complaining. Our tools, the, the enforcement tools we have don't enable us to deal with that. I mean, we have monetary penalties, uh, administrative fines, but they're not there for, 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 for individuals. So, yeah, we will make it work. Uh, we have this uh, uh, arrangement of the one-stop shop, the consistency mechanism coming up through the, the regulation, which, as it goes through discussions in, particularly in the council in Brussels, is just getting more and more complex. Uh, if there are pages and pages just about how we ensure consistency uh, 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 across Europe. So I just come back to the, the, the point to conclude with that, that all are made, because I think all was talking about the courts and suggesting they might be indifferent to the disconnect between law and reality. 
Uh, I worry a little bit the same about those who are now drafting the regulation, and particularly as we get onto the uh, uh, trilogue process. Is there going to be a disconnect between those who are trying to come up with a, 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 a legal instrument that solves everybody's problems and brings the whole of Europe, all 28 countries together in, in, in one solution? They may do that, but will it address the reality? And I think one of the realities at the end of the day has to be this access to justice. Because if it, it's all about individuals and protecting individuals. Uh, 30 pages of sort of legal niceties on how the one-stop shop operates don't actually help individuals. They need simple, clear law, rights which are easy to exercise, even if they're not perfect. And we aim a bit too much for perfection and not enough for effective, uh, uh, effective rights in, in reality. So I'll, I'll stop there. And thank you very much.